And just for the listeners as well, like your hormones, they're chemical messengers which speak to different cells in the body and, and you know, elicit uh, different physiological responses depending on what the body requires at that time. And again, that stress adds into that. That's gonna change your hormone profile, which then changes your physiological responses, which then changes, it can change your mindset, it can change your thoughts, your emotions. And then those thoughts and emotions can then have an impact on, you know, neurotransmitters, hormones, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, um, everything's tied in together. Yeah, now, absolutely. just in saying that, just in saying that, does, can that, I'm assuming that can also lead to things like diabetes and things like that when you have this um, constant fluctuation of blood sugar levels and then your body's secreting insulin, et cetera, and then that becomes desensitized and then can lead to other things like, you know, diabetes and other um, health implications. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Um, and this is exactly what the research is currently looking at. Um, you know, binge eating disorder was only classified in 2013, which just blow, <laughs> blows my mind. Um, <laughs> really? Yeah, 2013 is when it was um, officially created as its own entity. Um, so the research now, when we're looking at like 2019, 2020, the stuff that's coming out is like, okay, what are the long-term effects from what's what's happened, you know, 10, 10 15 years prior? So, um, yeah, as I said, the major things have been the Addison's disease and looking at adolescents who are now into their mid-20s who are experiencing pre-diabetes and diabetes. So mm. it'll be interesting to see what kind of comes out of these studies in the next couple of years. Gotcha. Yeah, sorry, I kind of, we went off on a little bit of a tangent there. <laughs> I just wanted no, to bring no, up a couple of those points because my brain was just ticking. <laughs> and again, that's how, you know, it affects people on a daily basis. Like, you know, to the point where it's like, you're waking up in the middle of the night dehydrated it affects how you perform and and speak to your friends the next day you know you it all links in so i guess one of the things that my clients have has mentioned to me it's like and we all kind of say it when we have our round tables and our workshops it's like the biggest thing that binge eating disorder affects is is our social lives and um for those of you guys that have listened to our previous podcasts i've experienced six eating disorders in my time I've recovered from all six um, and I'm still going through and working through body dysmorphic disorder but when I look at all six of them binge eating disorder is the, for me by far the worst like it affected me on so many different levels and the biggest one for me as well was socially so um, binge eating disorder can cause people to feel really anxious around food going to events going out for dinner and you know I've had clients that have avoided going out for dinner for months at a time because the nature of their disorder, you know, people will choose to avoid or isolate themselves just to not be around food because they're scared of losing control or being at a grazing table where it's like, I know I'm not gonna be able to stop myself. You've got this one component there and then you've also got this other component where, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but people become anxious about the event and then binge eat prior so then they're not mm. able to enjoy or attend the event because of the binge. And this is really, really common. And I've had clients struggle with this, like not being able to go to weddings and concerts and dinner events and out on dates because they've become so anxious in the day that they've binged and then they can't make it to the event because they feel sick. Mm. And now when you've also got body dysmorphic disorder as a comorbidity, it's hard to attend events anyway because you've also got this perception of yourself and it's like you know if you think there's a perceived flaw it's like i don't really want to go i want to wear something different i want to hide so you've got this combination of two things it's like i'm either going to overeat or i don't want people to see me so it gets really really difficult for people to put themselves in social situations or new situations and you know when someone has a binge and then they you know they have to bail out people are like oh this person's a flake and it's like well they're not really a flake it's the fact that they're in a position where they can't move because they've just created this distress and they've gotten themselves into a binge cycle so mm. let's pause there for a second as well because that can be like really powerful as well if you know if other people are thinking those thoughts about you or you're perceiving that they're thinking those thoughts about you, even just the perception of that, then that's going to, you know, that could potentially be a trigger for that downward mm -hmm. spiral, right? That yep. could trigger an episode, just simply Absolutely. perceiving that other people are going to be thinking that and you don't show up and people think that you're a flake or whatever. Yep. 
And this mm. is where, you know, when people say binge eating, um, you know, eating disorders are complex, this is where it gets complex. Mm. There's mm. a lot of things going on. And like, on a personal example, when I look at my binge eating disorder, when it was really extreme, my body dysmorphic disorder was really extreme as well. So there's a period of my life where it's about three years, basically the entire time I lived in Sydney, where there's no photos of me. Mm. I basically never went to Sydney, if it, you know, you look at photos. Um, and you, and you wore moo-moos to the gym. And I wore moo-moos to the gym. <laughs> I, couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't handle being in photos because I perceived myself one way because my binges were so bad. So I felt puffy. I felt sick. I was like, I don't want people to see me. I'm hiding. And, you know, while I control my binge, my, my body dysmorphic disorder now, there's still periods of time where I might take a selfie or two and then I look at it and I'm like, absolutely not. I'm not taking any more photos today. Like, I just am not. So, so, so that know, one thing, that one thing can then impact the rest of your day. Exactly. Absolutely. Mm. And we'll talk about this soon, but that's also, you know, one of the reasons I'm personally off, you know, social media as well. Mm -hmm. So... There's a lot of different things that happen when you've got the two, two things swinging and swaying. Um, you know, I have clients, and I can empathise with this too, who have chosen not to date people for periods of time because either their binge eating disorder controls their ability to enjoy the date, or their body dysmorphic disorder controls their ability to feel worthy of meeting new people and going out and about. Like there's this perceived perception. It's like I don't want to meet new people. I feel crap. I've just had a binge. Like I don't want. I don't want people see me um and again it becomes that cycle of like mm. perception and it can just spiral in and out yeah that psychological component is so massive and that's something that we talk about as coaches all the time you know when i when i'm sure you're the same when i first trained started training people started coaching people like it was all about the training program nutrition plan mm -hmm. but then you know very soon realized that you know we had to address the psychological and behavioral components now the reason i bring that up is because uh i did hear about some recent research where um, they looked at people that were um, perceived to be carrying uh, f secrets that showed up as like a physical burden. So for example, um, people estimated that the hills that they were looking at were far steeper than what they actually were or the distances that they needed to cover were far further than people that um, perceived those burdens uh, differently, right? So the think about the words that we use when we're looking at um, secrets and burdens and things like that. You know, it's, it's weighing me down. I'm carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I'm sure we're gonna touch on this, but you know, the NLP practitioner in my mind is like, you know how we talk to ourselves how we associate with these um, different things is going to ultimately determine what our responses are going to be yeah is that correct or what are your what's correct. your line of thinking and on that yeah that i've got one more thing to touch on about in the social aspect of things but um language is one of the components we talk about in our um, psychoeducational components and um it's which is coming up right it's coming up yeah okay sorry i'm jumping so, ahead again <laughs> no, it's okay it's okay um this is more just, you know, that's the social effect that these, you know, disorders have for people, um, particularly for women. Um, you know, it becomes really complex and it's hard to explain to people when it's like, I mean, I want to make sure I articulate this properly because some of my clients have really wanted me to hone in on this. But, you know, I, for example, I received a, a, a card on my 30th birthday, right? And it, it was this moment of like holy crap not even my family know how much my eating disorders have taken away from my life right and a lot of women get this and they experience this and this card read <laughs> my mom's going to kill me but it said dear Catherine happy 30th I can't wait to see you as a wife right now, firstly, let's just put aside the fact that I'm a happy, strong, powerful woman running two successful businesses. I've recovered from six eating disorders. I've traveled 50 countries and my value doesn't depend on my marital status. But let's look at how even my close family are unable to recognize how much my eating disorders affected me in my 20s, right? So while most girls in their 20s were out dating and thinking about weddings and talking about kids and stuff, I've never 
thought about those things because I spent my 20s waking up thinking, will I make it through today? And then eventually getting to that recovery stage of being like, how can I make it through today? And while I've lived a very fun and fulfilling life, my 20s were still gripped by the illnesses themselves or the recovery process. So a lot of the women that are working with me in a single are in their 30s you know, I can empathize with them because it's like a lot of us haven't started dating until we're like 26, 27 because we couldn't go to work some days. The last thing we're thinking about is finding a husband grandmother. Like, you know what I mean? It's, we have to have spent the time recovering and going through these processes to be where we're at today and, you know, get to that point where it's like, okay, who will I help make it through today? And, you know, obviously for me, I'm at that point where I'm recovered and I'm able to help others and give others, you know, um, tools and techniques and therapy and how, you know, happy and whole. But there are a lot of people who experience eating disorders that miss out on large parts of life because of it. And when we talk about that, a lot of women, you know, they enter their thirties and if they're, you know, they're single or they've just gotten into a relationship, people ask the question of like, do you want kids? And a lot of women don't answer it the way they want to because of the lack of awareness around body dysmorphic disorder now for me I absolutely not I just say absolutely not because of where I'm at in my life right and body dysmorphic disorder means that you're hyper aware of your body and that bodily trans transformation that you go through pregnancy for a lot of us that's just anxiety thinking about it right so can, can I can I pause there for a second yeah because you said you're hyper aware of your body now is that like real awareness or is it perceived awareness because if i like i'm yeah because that's 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 the reason why i wanted to stop there for a second because like i can say that i'm hyper aware of my body okay but what i mean by that is not like i'm picking it apart i mean like i can tell when my stress levels are a little bit high or my accumulated stress load over a couple of days is a little bit high and I know that I need to maybe take a little bit easier with training today and I need to do some more mindfulness based work or maybe I'm I can feel my body's like maybe um, uh, a little bit depleted in certain nutrients so I'm going to be looking for certain foods to balance that out etc etc so um, I just wanted to pause there for a second and, and highlight that point yeah so let me just kind of finish this because this is something my clients really wanted yep. me to say okay yeah, so yeah, sorry. Um, you know, as I said, I will say absolutely not right now because I'm aware that my body dysmorphic disorder isn't gone, you know, and while I don't have a partner, it matters maybe a bit less, but for those that do, there needs to be that awareness that for people on the other side of the relationship, because some females don't want to put themselves through that huge bodily change while their disorder affects their image so strongly as it is, it's hard to discuss that with people. So, you know, I've started living a very successful life and it's liking what I do, how I do it, um, liking myself as I do it. And yeah, if my body dysmorphic disorder goes away in six weeks or six months or you know another year, then obviously the answer's gonna change. But there's an awareness that society needs to understand for women who experience body dysmorphic disorder. And that is that a lot of people won't go through that process of pregnancy until they're ready because we don't want to worsen the condition. Now, unfortunately, this leaves some females not willing to date long term or not willing to date at all as they believe that or they feel that their partners are scared about not being able to have a family. And that's not the case because body dysmorphic disorder can be treated and a partner should be there to help that make that happen. So again, there's this lack of awareness that can create complications on social and relationship fronts. And then that's you know, then that's what brings us into understanding eating disorders on a psychoeducational level. And you know, what we teach at Macro's Muscles Mindset is not just for clients, but it's in their support system too. So it's being able to create this awareness for partners as well, where it's like, okay, right now this person isn't ready to, you know, go through the process of pregnancy because mentally that perceived perception of themselves is too too scary. It's causing too much anxiety, mm -hmm. and this person's going to need another year or two before we can move into that mm -hmm. stage. And it's really difficult conversations to have with people, particularly oh, if you're just starting dating. So they are the important clients, conversations though. Yeah, and this is why my clients are like, Kat, please mention this tonight because like people ask me this question if I want kids and it's like, yeah, but I can't right now because of how I feel about myself. So mm. I really just wanted to pop that out there um, before I move into the next component of stuff. Yeah, cool. Just before we get into the next component, again, I'm probably skipping ahead, so apologies if I am. 
But what I want to ask is like, how much do your habits play into these conditions? Okay, we're going to go straight into it. We're going to go straight right. into it now. So, good segue. Um, yeah, good segue. 